Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for our gathering. We thank you for your word, Lord. And that here and now, we can ask, Lord, that you would come. We thank you, Lord, that your presence has already been here. And that the richness of your presence grows as we ask for you, Lord. And we focus all of our hearts and all of who we are upon who you are, Lord. The reality of your presence becomes deeper and richer and better in each moment. So, Lord, we release ourselves to you here and now to hear from your word, to hear from you, Lord, to teach us something that comes directly from your heart, Lord. Perhaps it's something new that's never been heard. Perhaps it's something old that we need to hear again, Lord. We just pray for that newness and that freshness in our hearts to go after you with all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been not yet covering lessons from our Lord, but we are stepping into this series and one that is going to take a little time for us to get through in the best possible ways. Because I'll tell you, when you look into and look at the life of Jesus, the more you get to step into that, ah, oh, man, that's good. Right? Even one of those, have you ever looked at somebody's life? Like, and, and if I could use this as a little bit of an illustration, you see magic, right? Or an illusion that somebody performs on stage. And what's usually your response when they do that? Ooh, right? Ah, right? Yes, yeah. You know, and I'll tell you, one of the beautiful things about looking into Jesus, right, is he's more than magic. He's miraculous. He is he was a living miracle when he was here on the earth. And it's a joy and a miracle that he is in our midst today. Right? You ever just think about that? And the joy of what that is of Jesus in our presence. And that we can look upon that and we should most certainly go, Ooh! Ah! Man! That is good! All right, now, I'm, I'm gonna, we've done acapella already this Sunday. You know, you already knew this was coming as I was going this direction. All right? So I want you to think about the goodness of who Jesus is and looking upon his life and, and doing your own little, ooh, ah, man, that is good. Okay, so let me hear it. Ready? Ooh, ah. All right. We're going to work on that. We're going to work on that. So... So, but do you, I mean, do you get it? Does it connect? You know that the more we look into Jesus' life, the, the, the closer we draw to understanding and knowing him, the more that he just is, he, he's a mind blower. He is a mind blower. I actually, I just saw an illusionist at, uh, the, they had one at the Church of God convention. And this guy had an Oreo that I figured out later that uh, he, he acted like he took a bite out of the Oreo, but it was just, it was plastic and it snapped back. But then he acted act, act like he spit it back. I'm like, Poof. and then the Oreo reappeared. It was amazing, right? Until I figured out, I looked a little deeper into this guy. I was like, he just had a fake Oreo. And it was on like a retraction system where it jumped right back on there, right? And there was a moment of ooh and ah and some other things that this guy did. But the moment I looked closely into this guy, I was like, well, that wasn't very amazing, really. Nothing special happened at all other than he bought a pretty cool fake Oreo and found a way to trick my mind with it. Right? Another illusionist. But Jesus is the real deal. And so when we look into his life and the deeper we draw into him, the more we can get that real, ooh, ah, oh my goodness, Lord, that is good. And I want to learn that too, right? Have you ever been there? You watch an illusion? I wish I could do illusions like that and card tricks and other such that, that illusionists could do. Have you ever th seen a, the, one of those tricks and said, I wish I could do that? Amen. Right? <laughs> and, 
And, but that's one of the things in connections and looking into the life of Jesus, the more we look into his life, that we'd say, I want that. I want, I want to do that like Jesus did, does that. The way that he loves and the way that he, he spread joy and the way that he was so strong and bold in the truth and the way he depended upon the Spirit and the way that he answered the call of the Father day in and day out and the leading of the Spirit and all everything that we can look at in the life of Jesus and say, I see it and I want it. But here's one of the things about Jesus. And I think one of the things that we need to learn to love most about him is that there are sometimes those things that we can look at Jesus and say, I see what you did there, Jesus, but I don't know how much I really want that for myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the, the, the love pieces and the joy pieces and the peace pieces and, and all those other things that... I can look at and say, I want that. You see, but here is something about our Lord that we need to learn about him or to relearn and to draw into our own lives. Let me begin by asking a question to filter in what we're going to cover this morning. Um, how many of you guys woke up uh, this morning and the first thing you did was looked down and saw a tack and chose to step on it just to get your morning started. Okay, you're like, Pastor Josh, you're asking a kind of crazy question. Does anybody do that? If you're looking for something to wake you up in the morning, you found what you need, right? Okay, Joe is raising his hand. I got one taker, right? No, you, you get a cup of coffee, and for a lot of us, we say, uh, just don't talk to me for a little bit, Okay. Let me, let me get this cup of coffee in, let it process itself in my body so that I'm a little more awake. Um, I'm not quite ready to, to, you know, to have so much joy and energy coming my way because I don't have any right now. That's where you can give an amen, right? Uh, how many of you yesterday, when it was, I don't know, 102 degree heat index here, and where it's been 106 degree heat index here for, I don't know, the last eight days in a row, and we're all jealous of the people who are not here because they're probably traveling north today, not in the heat of mid-Florida, right? But how many of you yesterday, if you are here, um, said, you know, I don't think it's hot enough. I'm going to turn my heater on and see if I can get my temperature up to 125 degrees. Right? That makes sense, right? No! No, of course not. Pauline, if you're doing that, we need to talk. I have... I have a uh, coffee with the pastor sign-up sheet in the back, okay? And if you're answering yes to any of these things where it's like, oh, yeah, I, I step on tax on the morning, and, and I turn my heater up when it's 106 degrees outside, it's perfectly normal, right? So please sign up and back for a date. Let's sit down and have coffee together and have a good conversation. But I ask these questions in sarcasm because here's the reality of things. That when you look upon the life of Jesus, who he is, and what he did, Jesus chose to place himself into an uncomfortable situation. Amen. Right? Now we asked questions just, just a moment ago, and you're probably thinking, why would anybody do that? Why? Why would anybody choose to put themselves in an uncomfortable situation? And that is what we discover about the heart of our Lord, where he says, I will do it because I see in putting myself in that uncomfortable situation what can be brought in to it. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8 here together. If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. This is the Apostle Paul writing. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing, and I love that word, 
it says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is one of those passages that you can just read and read and read over and over again. And when you really process it in heart and all that these words mean in understanding who Jesus is in his nature. Because if, you, if paying attention here, that's what we're going to be going after. What can we learn from Jesus's nature? That he took on the form of a bond servant. And you even you and you even get to you literally see him take that picture on when he lived his life on the earth. That when he washed the feet of his disciples, he derobed himself, right? And he got water and a bowl and he kneeled before his disciples to wash their feet. So that they would get the message that I did not come to be served, but to serve. In another passage, it, Jesus says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In another place, Jesus says, I did not come to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Now, I don't know if you're hearing it right now, but this is a very counter-cultural <laughs> message. It is one that is excessively and exceptionally hard to get because of the world that we live in. And even because of the world that was living before I was living. And I, I thought it goes like, let's, let's dive, in, dive into this a little bit and see you know, what examples could be had of just how much uh, we want to go after things the way we want them for our own lives. So I found a video clip that this thing goes back, but you'll see its point made as we watch it together. CJ, could you hit the lights right here for me, please? Oh, they're already on. Yep, go ahead, Becky. We are good. Now that was excellent, wasn't it? Okay, I gotta tell you, so I stood off to the side just so I could see some of y'all's faces as you were watching it. And, uh, and some of you were like smiling like, I, re I remember this commercial and I remember this song. And then some of you were looking at it like, 
what is going on with this commercial here? Right? Anybody want to take a guess at how old this commercial is? Did it say it? Oh! Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, 1974. So this was nine years before I was even born. And, I'll, and so the have it your way tagline was strong, right? And people loved to hear it. I'll tell you, I'm going to actually use, use this as well, the have it your way. I'm going to try and go in there, have it my way. Can I, I'd like a free Whopper. <laughs> are, you, what are, you, are you saying I can't have it my way? <laughs> Right. We draw a line in here. Answer the survey. Yeah, but it's a, answer the survey. Get a free burger. Yeah. yeah. Sure you can. But this is this is one of the things, right? That has been not not just talked about in our world and seen in advertisements, but literally beaten into our heads. And here's what happens: what is beaten into our heads also goes into the heart, right? Living in there. And I'll tell you, if there was one thing that has been excessively hard and challenging for America, it is to step away from that selfish, that selfish life and into the selfless life. You know, and we do want to be cautious here because, you know, even in the text that we read, it says, you know, don't, it, it's not that you shouldn't take any concern whatsoever in your own needs. But what you do need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things that we need will be added to us. Do not worry about what you need. Your heavenly Father is well aware of what you need. And what you need is to not have it your way. What you need is to have it his way, his will, his direction for your life. So that it can be a life that brings life to others. Do Whoppers bring life? No! No! And I know, I ask that question, and start, like, like, no, I'm pro I've probably lost maybe four years, depending on how many Whoppers I've eaten. You saved your life. Saved, saved your life? Yeah. Okay. Well, no Whopper did that for me. You saved your life before you were hungry. Yes. It was good food for hunger, but not good food for body. Right? And, and so, what, so what are we getting at here? What are we pursuing? What was and what is the nature of Jesus? He chose to make himself a bondservant and to come into this world to die for all of us that we might live. And I don't want us to lose focus on the words that Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 8 ends with. Again, let us read verse 8 together. And being found in appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the death, to, of death, even death on a cross. Right? And, and why was this? Why was it that Jesus was willing to do this? It was because of the joy that was set before him. Take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Let's read that together. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Now, the picture that we should get out of this is when it comes to the comfort in the moment and what we want in the moment, we want it right then and there in that moment, right? Does that, you can almost, that, if somebody asked me to define selfishness, that's a pretty good decision, that, the definition. I know what I want, when I want it, how I want it, and I want it right now. That is selfishness. But Jesus... When we look upon him in his nature, what we find in him is, I am going to set the joy before me. And what is that joy? Knowing that he would be seated at the right hand of God when he came and said, I choose to get myself uncomfortable for the purpose of bringing life into the world and bringing love and light 
that the name of the Father would be glorified, and so that we could glorify the name of the Lord. Amen. That is the heart of Jesus. And if that is the heart of Jesus, the question for us today is, what is our heart? If Jesus was willing to get uncomfortable, do we carry that same spirit, that same willingness to say, I can look at this and I don't necessarily want to do it, but I hear the call of God and I'm going to choose to do it because it brings him glory. And that is the joy that should be set before us. Do you get that? Right? That we look upon our lives and not thinking about what should I gain in the moment in this fleeting passing of time. That's basically what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is, is even about when, when you read it. It's like, what, what is the purpose of life? I mean, when it becomes vain pleasures and pursuing all that this world has to offer, it's like a wind. It blows away. It's here and it is gone. I mean, how many of you can testify of that reality today? I mean, I'm 36 years old and I've done plenty of things which bring me pleasure but have not necessarily brought, my, brought me joy, nor the Lord joy. And those things I look upon and say, why? Why did I even bother with those things or bring the, allow them into my life or choose to do them? Well, it was because of the selfishness that was set before me that I said, this is what I want here and now. But as I, what, what does Paul say in Galatians 2.20? And these are words that we should seek to echo along with the apostle where he says, let me make sure I get the whole verse, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and delivered himself up for me. Jesus delivered himself for me so that I might have life to live in him. And so the question comes in, what do I have the opportunity to deliver to my Lord? He gave his life for me. And the call and the challenge and the lesson from our Lord is to go and do likewise. To give our life for him. And his life became a ransom for many. And he means to use our life to make him known so that people would still be ransomed today. You know, we could, we could, man, every one of us could probably talk about regrets that we have and things that we've done because we knew we did it in the moment of a selfish and vain pleasure at the time. And every one of us would probably share in full agreement of, I wish that I hadn't. I see what I did and I see what it brought into my life, what it's brought into others' lives. It's, it, it's no, it was worth nothing. It was worthless. If anything, it was the opposite. It was death and darkness. <coughs> and that is the way that the world goes. Seek comfort. Find comfort. How, I mean, how many things can you get that has the word comfort in it? Comfy, we want comfy beds. And with our comfy beds, we want comfy sheets. And we want comfy seats and comfy shoes and comfy clothes and comfy, comfortable temperature. That's an important one. Comfort foods, like a Whopper. <laughs> comfort, comfort, comfort. And the question has to be asked today of what is your heart captured by? Is it captured by comfort and seeking it? Or is it captured by Christ and seeking him and all that he would have for you? Because if you would seek him and all that he would have for you, you'll never have a regret. If you remember last week's service, Cherie reading that letter to us and talking about the life that God, was that two Sundays ago? Two Sundays ago. Where does the time go? Two Sundays ago when Cherie read that letter to us and saying, I've been here and look what this church has done. 
And why is that? Because the life of God is in it. It is alive. And if we would make the life of God every day and every moment alive in us, I'm telling you, you will never have any regrets. I look at the picture of Cherie, Candace too, among others of which we've seen so much beauty and spiritual growth because we are captured in the heart and the love and the will of Jesus Christ to pursue that. And, you, and we, we will never regret that. If anything, that is what we will look upon and say, that is a life well lived, a life worth living. But to get there, sometimes it takes those pieces of stepping out of the comfortable and into the uncomfortable. Jesus exchanged glory for mortal flesh and in the mortal flesh suffered all the pains and all the temptations and all the horrific things that we all know that we go through from day to day living in this body of flesh. I don't mean to make our lives sound too morbid. It is also good because God has given us this life, but it, this is not an easy life to live in, an easy world to live in because there is a darkness set against us that wants to keep us from the light of Jesus Christ. And one of those things that would keep us from him is the word comfort. A word closely associated with that, complacency. Now I've gotten comfortable. Now I wanna stay comfortable. And so the word to us today and to me as well is, what is the Lord saying? Is there something that we're not doing in our lives where he's saying, I want you to get uncomfortable and I want you to get uncomfortable in this way. And this may even have some roots in it, some deep roots, because the reality is once selfishness sets in, once complacency sets in, which, is, which are things that are, that are not of God, and the longer that they linger, the harder those things are to pull out. And we certainly cannot do it by our own strength, but only by the strength of Jesus Christ and the Spirit living in us. To not just draw those things out, but to throw them out and cast them aside so that the light of life, the light of Jesus Christ would enter in. And who knows what God will do in the beauties of our discomforts. We may think it looks ugly, we may even get a little ugly when we're in discomfort. I don't like where I am. Why are you asking me to do this, God? Oh, you will see. You will see. Set the joy before you that we have been given a life to live for the Lord and to be able to live it well for him. You got it? Amen. Is that a good lesson from our Lord? Amen. So... Who's ready to go step on attack? <laughs> Joe. Now, I joke in that in jest, okay? But let us take this and let the Lord work it into our hearts in whatever way he wants to work it into us. Lord, is there something that I'm pulling back on you with where you're saying, get uncomfortable? You know, hearing the call, but saying, oh, I don't think so, Lord. That just looks like a little too... A little too much of a pit for me to be in, or too much for me. I, I hope that you would see that, but then respond with the right spirit. True, too much for you. Oh, but he will pour himself into you so that you would be able to do all that he calls you to according to his riches and his glory. We find them in our Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, we thank you that you get uncomfortable for us, that you got uncomfortable for us even to the point, Lord, of stretching yourself out and dying on the cross for us. Lord, that you know us, and you know uh, of the times in which we need correction, the times that we need encouragement, even the times in which we may need a rebuke, because, Lord, we can make our life about living for ourselves. But Lord, you set the example by giving your life for us. 
And it says in your word, Lord, that if we suffer with you, we will also reign with you. So, Lord, let us gain that message anew today. That we would even be called into a life of suffering. There's so many pictures in this, Lord. So many lives that every one of whom you called in your close core, the apostles, except for John, who became martyred men. They literally died for you. And Lord, we ask that while your call over our lives may not be a literal and physical death, it is certainly, Lord, a dying unto ourselves and a crucifying of the flesh so that all of us may be for all of you. Lord, let us seek not comfort, but let us seek you as we go here. In Jesus' name, amen.